Well, it is time for another tutorial. And this is more of an introduction video to my two-part tutorial that I'll be uh, releasing part one later this week. The uh, holiday schedule has thrown things off just a little bit, but bear with me. I'll be right back on track soon enough. But this two-part series, I thought, definitely warranted some good explanation and introduction beforehand. But before I get into that, I want to get into a little matter of uh, controversy that I've had to address in some of the video comments. And that is my hair and my beard. This is all OEM follicles. I do not wear a hair piece or a fake beard. And that actually came up in a comment section. So um, there you go. Fire put out. Um, shim technique. Now, this is, a, this is an important part of the mold making arsenal. And this is why I thought this really deserved a good introduction to this two-part series. Um, shims are a, a really critical part of two-part mold making, three-part molds, whatever. Uh, many of you are familiar with using shims for mold making, using pieces of brass stock or aluminum shims. Uh, basically stuck into the clay, even playing cards can be used to build a dividing line. And what I'm going to be showing is a, a spin-off of that technique using wax paper cups as shim material. And the reason for the wax paper cups is the wax coating prevents the silicone from sticking to, and even polyurethane from sticking to that. But it's real important to understand the shim method and how to apply it, when to apply it, and why to apply it. Now, first off, the why of it all is when you're dealing with a pattern that is fragile or unwieldy, it might be too big to lay down and build a proper clay wall, that's where shims come into play. Um, now, obviously, this pattern here, this uh, shall we call him Pizza Rat, uh, he's made of TC-808 resin, so he's going to hold up well for making a traditional clay wall but I'm gonna be using him in this video for making a shim wall around him. Now, and I'll get into that more in the video why I chose the, this particular part because some of you will have questions once you see that process being done about how it relates to other surfaces and our little pizza rat will help us with that. Um, but the whole point of this kind of shim technique, be it aluminum shims or brass shims or cardstock or whatever, is it allows the mold maker to make a multiple piece mold all at one time. So instead of having to lay down a part and mold one half of it, flip it over, mold the other half of it, we could have a part, again, a fairly complicated part, where we can establish our shims and we could put rubber on multiple parts of the mold all at one time. So it's a big time-saving technique, and it's a, believe it or not, as tedious as this looks when you first see it, it actually is a fairly fast technique too. This particular mold that I did over the course of about, uh, I think it, think it took me start to finish, um, including the mother mold, maybe six hours to make this mold. Um, and the shim, the actual shim part of it, took maybe 15, 20 minutes to build that. Uh, so if it's done properly, you can move fast, you can mold all kinds of things like this, but where it really shines is in the art bronze world because that's where you typically have clay sculptures coming in that are way too complicated to mold with a traditional clay wall. So again, this technique allows us to establish that parting line on a piece with it standing upright, and then we can apply our rubber or our polyurethane or uh, silicone, whatever rubber we're going to be using for that, onto both parts of the piece all at one time. So very handy for that, a good time-saving technique, and, uh, and because it is a brush-on mold, material-saving too, because it doesn't use as much material as, say, a poured block mold. But like any technique in the mold-making world, be it uh, brush-on molds or matrix molds or uh, poured block molds, all of those have their place. So it's real important to know when to use that technique to get the best results out of that technique. Obviously, typically on something like this, I would mold it, just lay it down, build a clay wall, and do it that way. But there are times when, again, we're molding something really fragile, like uh, this boot. This is a, a, a boot that I molded a while back um, that obviously did not lend itself to a clay wall. A boot like this, since uh, the original um, boot material is flexible, 
uh, that could cave in and move around and we wouldn't get an accurate mold. So this is the exactly the kind of uh, situation where the shim technique excels. And also monument pieces, like uh, this is a, a conquistador that I molded that was pointed up from a original sculpture that I think was like quarter scale. Um, this was molded uh, using a combination of silicone and polyurethane, and you could see those shim lines all over this guy uh, that divided him up, and that was way easier and much faster than trying to uh, build clay walls on uh, you know, a seven or eight foot sculpture. So again, real important to know when to use this process so that you get the best results from it. And again, it does seem a little tedious when you see how the uh, shim wall is built. Uh, this is one of those things that initially is a little intimidating, but once you get used to this technique, it works incredibly well and you can do it really fast on some pretty complicated pieces. Now, last but not least, Material selection, this is uber important for this process to work. Ideally, especially if you're doing uh, multi-part molds that are going to be keying together, because obviously that's the point of the shims, where those key together, you want a silicone or a polyurethane that's relatively firm, not too hard, but, but firm. So typically what I would recommend for this is a silicone that's in the range of about a 25 to maybe all the way up to a 40, but I really wouldn't go much higher than a 40 for this. But uh, we want something flexible, but we don't want something too flexible. If it's too soft, then when we go to clamp this shell together, we could get some distortion. So you want something around a 25 to 35, maybe a 40 tops. And most importantly, if you watched my talk with Tom from BJB about thixotropic additives, you want to be able to control the thixotropic qualities of the silicone or the viscosity, you want to be able to manage that and be able to have a silicone that you can change from a very runny uh, print coat all the way up to a really thick, almost like frosting consistency. So real important before you buy silicone, you want to make sure you understand this process and that you get silicone, that you can adjust that thickness and that you can manage that as you go through the, the flow of making that, uh, that mold. Because you want something that, again, that you could do a thin print coat all the way up to a really thick, uh, what we call shim tack for one of the steps in this. But uh, that's usually achieved by using a thixotropic additive. So in this case, I'll be using the 5130F, which is a fairly fast formula that allows me to move pretty quick. So I only have about maybe 15 to 20 minutes downtime between coats. And then I'm thickening that up with the SC5001. Now, real important, I've had some people ask about thixotropic additives and whether or not those deteriorate the molds over time, and they do not, provided you're using the right silicone thixo for the silicone that you're using. And you can always figure that out by talking to the manufacturer and make sure, and that's one of the reasons I had that talk with Tom about thixotropic additives. So I'll actually be using a combination of thixotropic additives. I'll be using the SC5001, and then where I need it really thick, like frosting or almost bread dough consistency, I'll be using a combination of the, uh, the liquid thickener, the SC5001, plus the fiber thick thickener. So I hope you all stay tuned for that. That's gonna be a, a fun two-part video. I'll be making the silicone mold in one video, and then part two, I'll come back and make the resin mother mold over the top of that. And again, that just gives us a nice lightweight mold that uh, if done in accordance with the prophecy, you see our parting line there, when that's uh, tightened up, that can just disappear, and we get a really nice, uh, clean parting line. So. Hope you'll stick around for that tutorial. And uh, again, that'll be the first part will be coming out late this week. And uh, in the meantime, if you haven't already, be sure to like and subscribe, click the little bell icon so you get notified when I post new content. And of course, thanks for watching and supporting the channel.